So welcome. Uh, just want to thank everyone for coming. Um, this has been kind of a crazy conference to set up. Uh, it's kind of a funny story. We we you know kind of didn't intend to actually put on a conference. It came, kind of came out naturally. Um, we invited some of our Chicago developers to come up for a talk that we were going to have here, and people were like, "Hey, you know, if everyone's going to come into town, we should do a front-end developer conference." And the idea was kind of like, "Really? We could do that?" And then it sort of snowballed into, "Yeah, that'd be awesome. So let's totally do it." So here it is. Uh, we think we put together like an awesome lineup of speakers, uh, so it should be really fun. And I thank everyone for coming out. A uh, couple of sort of housekeeping items. Uh, bathroom is just kind of out the hall, uh, straight to your left. Um, there's food and drinks and stuff will be kind of in the kitchen throughout the day. Uh, feel free to help yourself to anything in the fridge. Uh, I want to thank um, Peter Cooper that runs HTML5 Weekly. Uh, it's an awesome newsletter. If you guys aren't on it yet, uh, you should definitely sign up. Uh, it's easily the best source of information for you know HTML5 and stuff like that. And he really helped us kind of spread the word, uh, gave us a, a, a you know, line item in his newsletter one week. That was awesome. Uh, and then lastly, I just want to thank Groupon uh, for kind of making this all possible. It's kind of an idea that just a couple of our developers here had, and Groupon let us run with it, uh, helped us make it free, and provide everything that, 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 that you guys will enjoy today. Um, so. That's it. So just thanks for coming. Without further ado, uh, we'll just get started with the first talk, which is uh, Peter Bergstrom. We'll be talking about Ember.js. Hey, guys. Let's get this on. All right. Um, so yeah, my name is Peter Bergstrom, and I'm the engineering lead for Groupon Scheduler. And um, I'm here to talk about Ember.js in the wild. So I've been doing Ember.js um, for Groupon Scheduler for probably about six months. But uh, I've been doing client-side MVC for a long time. So a little bit of background from, uh, about myself. I've been doing client-side MVC apps for five some years now. Uh, I worked at Apple using Sproutcore uh, before it was actually called Sproutcore, really. Uh, so I've seen the evolution of what Ember.js you know, evolved from. Uh, from from the beginning, so I worked out on .Mac, Mobile Me, and iCloud apps. Um, and the last thing I did was actually architect the uh, Mobile Me iCloud uh, calendar client uh, using Sproutcore. Um, but 18 months ago, I left Apple uh, for a, a startup called Strobe that worked on an HTML5 um, uh, platform. I would I would probably call it. Um, it was founded by um, Charles Jolly, who was the creator of Sproutcore. Ember.js uh, started as a little internal project called uh, Sproutcore 2.0. Basically, the idea was that Sproutcore has a lot of really cool things, but you don't want to download a meg and a half of JavaScript onto your client before you have to use it. So basically, the idea was to come up with a more lightweight uh, framework that has the ideas of Sproutcore, and then uh, make that into something that's very good for mobile devices. So that was uh, started uh, at Strobe by Yehuda Katz, Tom Dale, and Peter Wagonet. Um, those guys left Strobe. I left Strobe to uh, go to Groupon. So, and here I am. So what is Ember.js? Uh, who's familiar with Ember? So. I see people from my team because we're working on Ember apps <laughs> and some other ones. Um, so essentially, it's a JavaScript framework for creating. This is from the. Uh, this is actually from their website. A quote: "It's a Ember is a JavaScript framework for creating ambitious web applications that eliminates boilerplate and provides a standard application architecture." So, uh, and I'm sure people will ask a little bit about like the difference between Ember and Backbone and all that stuff. Ember is a little bit more. Um, it provides more architecture. It's bigger. It's not a micro framework. It's you know, it's like 300k uh, before it's compressed. So it's it's a lot bigger. It offers a lot of more features and all that stuff. But I think that's actually a good thing. So I'm kind of on the camp of providing more than less. So so what does Ember do to deliver on the promise um, of being an ambitious framework? Well. 
these are the things that I actually get really excited about. Um, handlebar templates, uh, data bindings and property observing, computer properties and state management. I think state management is probably the biggest thing that I'm excited about. Uh, and I'll go into detail about that later. So handlebar templates. Uh, anyone familiar with this? Excellent. Um, so the spin that Ember takes on you know, mustache tags and all that stuff is, I don't know if it's necessarily unique, but I really like it. So in this case, I have a person, myself, a first name and a last name. And you can basically just have a, uh, in your index file, you just have a script tag and you can just add, the, add mustache tags in there. The thing that's nice about it is that these are all bound properties. So when I change my first name here, it'll automatically update the template. So that's kind of the basics of handlebars. But you can do a lot more with it. So one of the things you can do, you can do conditionals, um, also based on computer properties. So like. If I have an object, I want to toggle if I'm presenter or not. This will automatically update the template without any more work I have to do. One thing that I use a lot in uh, my applications, for example, is looping. So if I have an array of people, it's very easy to just loop over it and have a list of people uh, without a lot of work. Uh, the other thing, other couple of things here, attribute bindings. So uh, one of the things I have in my model, and I'll go into an app in more detail, is that I have ma like map URLs. So here, I want to bind it, bind to it. So like, I have my model, I have a map, map URL. It's easy just to bind the, the source here without any additional uh, overhead. Um, however, my, if my map doesn't change very often, it, I could use this unbound property and just have it be printed out on the screen essentially, and then. I don't have to touch it later. The last thing, this actually has changed. Um, before they were using, uh, they had a button view uh, is for actions. Now they just have it an inline tag where you can just provide an action, the, um, I guess this is the action, and a target. So here it's target to my state chart. So that's another way to add interactivity to your app without a lot of work. The, the other thing is that, and I, I don't really know how to explain this or approach it because there's so many different ways to do it, is all these things are um, just markup, right? But sometimes you want more advanced views. So like one of the things you can do is you can actually have views just defined in line so you have a view with stuff inside of it. Or um, you can have a, your first template. I do this a lot because sometimes my templates can be really, really big. Uh, and I don't want to have you know, one template that's uh, 500 lines long. So I want to break it out into multiple templates. And one way to do that is just have a template name and then have a second, secondary template. And then if you really want to get custom, you can uh, actually extend em uh, Ember view and create a new view. And then you can put whatever you want in there for uh, really custom stuff. So that's the real basics of handlebars. Um, and with this, you can probably write 90% of Ember apps with this information. So, OK, data bindings and property observing. Uh, I know that other frameworks have data bindings and property observing as well. But uh, this is the, kind of the Sprawcore Ember way. And I, I, I've been doing it for so long, so this is second nature. But um, one of the things is that you know it provides glue between your model controller and view with a minimal markup. Uh, you can do this in handlebar templates or any arbitrary Ember object. So you, if you want a binding from your model, well, not your model, but your controller to review or something like that, it's very, very simple to do. Uh, and then observers just automatically detect the changes and trigger notifications to your application. And I guess, again, I actually touched on it earlier is that Handlebar template properties are bound by default. You can make them unbound if you want to for performance reasons. There's no point in, in making something a live binding if you're not actually going to use it. So this is how you do a binding in your, or a handlebars template. Basically, 
Um, there's a keyword here, binding. So this is the property name, binding, and the path. Uh, and then anything inside of there will just pick it up, like a local property to the view. Same thing here. Um, this is a view, but it could be any, any object. Just foo binding, app path to foo. So that is the uh, gist of that. The next thing is um, property, uh, uh, just basically property observing. It's very, very simple. Like this is, a, this is something that you see a lot is you have a binding and then you want to act some, you know, in your view, for example, if you want to set a visible binding based on some properties, uh, you can actually just do this. Uh, so you have, a, you have an observer, foo did change, and then you just add the dot observes here for foo. And then it automatically, yeah? Stupid newbie question. Sure. On uh, previous slides, you have script type text slash handlebars. Yeah. And uh, previous slash x handlebar, x dash handlebar. Oh, that might just be a typo. <laughs> okay. Which yeah. One is the I think it's, uh, hold on, let me go back. Yes, uh, that's the right one. Yeah, just a typo. Um, so let me see here. Yeah, so. That's how simple a, a uh, observer is. And I mean, in this case, I could just bound this property directly to is visible. So I could have is visible binding this. But um, if you want to have some more complex logic in there, it's, it's great to just have an observer like, defined like that. Uh, one note about binding some observers is that you need to use the get and set properties uh, or functions. So any object using uh, that's extended from ember object has uh, dot get and dot set. So if I want to get a property, I use that. If I want to set a property, I use that. And the reason why I want to use that is uh, while I can always just, you know, if I have my view or my object, I could just dot foo. That works. But if it's a binding, I'll just get the binding from there. I don't, won't actually get the real property. So that's why you want to use get, because it actually, like, resolves that for you. Uh, so the other thing is that if you have, this is something that's relatively, this is new for Ember, is that, uh, in Ember I should say, is that you can actually also use it on arbitrary hashes. Um, so when I worked at uh, Strobe, uh, one of the projects I did was I was doing um, a project for eBay to do a touch app for their site. So basically, for actually optimized for iPad. And one of the things that we ended up having problems with was that we wanted to optimize our JSON response and then display it. Uh, and we didn't want to load up all these, like, you know, we load up the hash, we create an object to make it nice, and we can use, you know, get and set and on it uh, in our handlebar templates. So basically, instead, we kind of push to just have, so we could do it on any hash. So it's a lot easier, uh, and you have to do less work in the end. You can also use uh, some other nice things. You can do uh, get path. So this is a this is pretty safe. So like one of the model, the, one of the things that I always see new people doing is that they do app dot get something dot get something dot get something. If anything is null in that chain, this you know things will blow up. So doing get path, it'll it's a safe way to do it, and you don't have to show, you know if anything in path to bar is undefined, we just un re return undefined without exploding. You can also use set path if you want to do that. Next thing, computer properties. Uh, so computer properties is basically a way to have like more complex logic, but it's actually fronted as a normal property. So I could do a relatively complex operation pulling different properties and combining that into one arbitrary property that is exposed to my, my for example, my view as one property, it's, it's, it's pretty nice. Then, um, and I'll actually go to the next slide, you can invalidate. So for example, I'm just gonna skip. Uh, so like here I have a string property. Um, my string property, is, and I'm gonna reverse it. So basically, when this changes, this function will invalidate and actually run this again. So if, if I don't do that, so so let's say that this doesn't change and I call this function a thousand times. It'll fir the first time, it'll run it. Every single time after that, it'll actually just pull the computer property without actually having to look at, you know, have to run this function. So using caching is 
uh, or property invalidation and caching is very nice. So you don't have to, you know, if it's have something that is very expensive to run, you can just run it once and uh, be done with it. Uh, one note is that cacheable is actually going to go away in the next, in future versions of Ember. Uh, you need it now if you're like using 098, I think, uh, but it's going to go away in 10, which is happening soon. All right. The next thing is state charts. Who's familiar with state charts? Who's familiar with using state charts for apps? <laughs> Guy in the back and go soon. All right. Uh, why, using, uh, why use state charts? Uh, like interactive apps contain a lot of state. And one trap that I've seen is that people start managing state by having a little variable here, a variable there. It's like, you know, my, my modal is open. Yes, you know, all that stuff. And, or look at class names or you know, something like that. It's very hard to manage. Uh, state charts makes this a lot more well-defined. Basically, it's, it allows you one centralized place to manage all the state for your application. Well, state chart. Uh, and the other thing that's really nice is that when you're in a specific state and you have an action in your app, it'll only get handled if it's defined as an action in that state. Otherwise, it'll just bubble up and get dropped on the floor if it's not actually valid. So um, here is a very, very basic state chart. So I have two states. I have loading, loading and loaded. So like, for example, this is a very you know, simple thing. Like, let's say I have a list, and I want to, you know, I'm viewing the list, and I'm scrolling down, and there's like a load more or something like that. Basically, this cycle. So I have loading. I have a, so when, when I'm done loading, I send an event called did load data that then transfers over to the loaded state or transitions to a loaded state. Then I have a, an action in, load, in the loaded state that lo called load more that then pushes it back into or uh, transitions into loading. So basically, it's very simple. But how do you actually do this in um, Ember? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Um, so Ember has a state chart uh, manager. That's your top level state chart. And uh, you can define an initial state. And I have two states. Two states, uh, loading and loaded. In my enter function here, I just call you know, something on my, in my app, very simple. I just app.load, just loads data. Uh, for this example, it doesn't really matter. And then I have a loaded state that just sits there. Let's say that the data is bound from the model and you don't have to worry about it in, in this case. Then I have two actions. I have did load data and load more. So when I'm in here and I do, a, I actually didn't show an example of this, but I could do app.state chart send did load data and, uh, with, with a response or any, you know, depending on how you set your state say chart up. Then it'll actually call this function Try, and try to transition to the loaded state, and then vice versa. So basically, you kind of, uh, the nice thing is that, let's say that you're um, in the loading state, and someone sends load more, that'll just get dropped on the floor because you're not in the right state. So that's really nice because, um, for, first of all, you can have UI buttons that either are active or inactive, but they don't actually trigger anything if I'm not in the right state. So like one of the things I do in, in the app I'm going to go over a lot is I have a back button. They all send the same action, back. But as I'm going through the application, I, if I click back, it knows which state I'm in and then it transfers to the next state, which basically just does a transition to like, just like here. And then I can just keep hitting back. The button's generic. It just has a generic action called back. And I don't have to care about where I am. Doesn't matter. So um, let me let me go back because this is actually a good point. Uh, all I do there it is. Action open and it's like back app state chart. So basically, mm. uh, then you can uh, you can do a binding. So it is visible. So I can have a property that that I set when I enter into my into my uh, uh, sp the specific state that just says hide this button. So I can have a controller uh, with a property saying like show button or something like that and you just turn it off. 
Uh, let me see if I can think. Oh, right. But, but the thing, the nice thing is that the button shouldn't care, right? The state shark cares. So it responds to the event that it needs to do. So like here, I have an open button. I can have 10 states with open actions that do all the different things. Depending on which state I'm in, it'll do the right thing. That's, I'll, I'll, I'll show an example. Here. All right, and I'll show an example. <laughs> so um, l let me show you an app that I've actually written uh, using Ember. Uh, so this is Groupon Scheduler's mobile booking uh, app. Basically, it allows uh, customers uh, who bought a Groupon to book their appointment online. So let's say that you I don't know, a massage or actually a high five with Simon. I, I bought a high five with Simon and um, I want to book it. You can basically use this application to book that. And let me show you how this works. I'm switching between. So uh, there are two things, two ways to do this. Uh, the first way, actually, I'm going to show you here, is that the business here is called Acme Handshakes. And I can book online. So basically, uh, that is really, really hard to see. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, you can basically just uh, go through and so a handshake. You can pick your time, enter your information. And now I have booked an appointment. So it actually shows up in the merchant schedule as an appointment. I get a confirmation email and all that stuff. But let's say that I'm on a mobile device. So this is the desktop experience. But if I'm on a mobile device and I'm on the same page here, that other one is not very optimized. So this is the application uh, right here. Uh, same, same data, but in a mobile UI. Um, so I can go through the steps here, you know, go through, figure out what time I want, all that stuff. Go right here, enter my contact info. And confirm my appointment. So same thing, but in a mobile experience. And that's all written in Ember. Um, but the thing that's relatively new is you can also do it via uh, the native app. So this is the Groupon native app. And I bought my Acme Handshake. I can actually. Just go in, hopefully it'll work. There you go. Uh, and book with it in a seamless experience. So this is, this is Ember.js running in a native wrapper. Uh, every, the rest of the app is, is native. But I can go and book. And if I, you know, I don't want to do this, I can just easily transition back to the, uh, the native app. So I'm going to get a low five. And here I can pre-fill the information because I know who you are. So I need to enter my phone number and confirm my appointment. And then I can just press done. And if I go back here, now it should say, now it actually says that I've actually done, uh, done a booking and it's confirmed. So that's the, that's the gist of the, the application right here. Yeah? Uh, it can. I'm not. Uh, basically, because here the information needs to be as up to date as possible, so I just fetch it every single time and when I need it. But um, there is a, there is a data store for Ember uh, that I think evolved from the Sprocker data store that's you know pretty advanced, uh, but a little, a little bit more lighter weight, so you could do a lot of a lot of really neat things with it. Uh, but I'm not using it here because I don't need it. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, let me. Let me go back here. So for example, like one of the things that you were asking about like responding to back events. So if I'm going right here, you see that I have a back button right here. Uh, the, in, in, the, in the code, the button just says, sends back. And now it sends back. 
but I'm in different states, so it knows which back to do. Uh, so that's 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 the nice thing about a state chart. So um, I'm going to go back to the presentation here, and I just want to go over this. This is the very high level state chart for the application. I'm not going to go into code right here because it's kind of verbose, but basically it has three major states. One, loading. Uh, if it's a bookable deal, it's bookable. And if it's already booked, I switch over to this little state that just shows the confirmation screen that you saw like when, I'm, uh, at the done, when I'm done with the, uh, the booking. So, okay, so the first thing is uh, the loading state. Basically, um, so you saw two modes that, that the application is running. One is that I'm on a merchant's website. I just click book. And then, oh, that's a typo. Uh, then the other one is there is uh, directly from Groupon, so inside of like the native app, for example. So basically, I get different state. Uh, I need to get different information. And here I need to load, you know, um, deal information and all that stuff. From here, I don't need to do any of that. So basically, it just makes a choice. If um, it actually says I've already booked this, it just goes to the book state immediately and says, "Congratulations, you have a booking. You're, you're, you made a booking already. You want to change it." Then the next thing is uh, this guy. So this, this is really where um, all, the, all the booking happens. Uh, so there's a couple of decisions that are made here in the locations. First, if I only want location, I don't need to show it. So you just skip the services. If, um, if I click in the list of locations and I click and I select a location, it just automatically forwards you here because you made one decision already. And then it narrows down your search. And then uh, like I showed earlier, there, everything has a back event. It just goes back to the previous state. So again, selecting services, um, selecting time slots. Time slots is pretty complicated. I showed like there's like a little mini calendar to slide, slide it down. Uh, you can do a lot of, you know, you can navigate months, you can get more data and all that stuff. Um, I'm not going to show that because it's kind of complicated, but uh, if you have any questions. And then entering your details. When I'm done, I do a save action. Uh, call the server, do a save, and then I go back to booked. Yeah? Uh, no. <laughs> Make it real? Uh, no, I mean, this is our own booking app. So, uh, probably wouldn't be too useful for you. <laughs> um, so anyway, so that's, that's a high level uh, state chart. So, a little bit about developer tools. Um, Sprockware had a ginormous build tool library that was pretty hefty. Um, Ember doesn't. So like when you start using Ember, it, you can kind of get lost. So like you, you get some boilerplate uh, HTML and some JavaScript. One problem that I have is that I want to have a nice hierarchy of my files. And um, you know, I want to have controls directory, models directory, views and you know subdirectories like that. Uh, one problem is if if I just ha add you know 20 different script tags on in, in my index, it's kind of complicated and will load slow and all that stuff too. So um, there's this thing called uh, Rake pi uh, Pipeline by Living Social that actually uh, 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 Yehuda and Tom uh, who work on Ember have worked with uh, with them. Basically, it's just a little thing you you can define your assets. And you can just, you know, for example, I have an asset file that says, you know, in my app directory, get everything that's a JavaScript file, combine it into one file for me when I run this script, uh, when I run Rake Pipeline. Same thing with CSS. So I have one file. Um, I can also set, like, inclusion order and all that stuff, which is really nice. Uh, I can show this to you, to you guys if you want to. Um, one thing is that you don't want to detect your changes and all that stuff. There is a watch here for, that starts a server. But for our architectures, we use PHP. Um, we actually, I actually just came up with like a custom script that monitors everything. And when it takes a change, um, it just runs rake p for me. And then uh, I use Jasmine for uh, testing as well. And um, some resources: um, emberjs.com. Uh, obviously, I think some guys probably check this out. Uh, GitHub has all the code on there has good examples and all that stuff. Uh, if you want to try Rake pip Pipeline, it's also on GitHub. And uh, one of the best resources probably to go to Ember.js on Freenode. 
if you have any questions and all that stuff. I'm in, I'm in that chat room pr pretty often as well. So if you guys have any questions. All right. Questions? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, have I ever tested memory usage between Ember and Backbone? Yes. I have not, but I'm pretty me uh, memory conscious. So, like one of the examples of the stuff that I've done with Sprocore was, um, you know, uh, at, at Apple, we we wrote a calendaring app that was, you know, pretty comparable to like I iCal in functionality on the web. And one of the things there was that, you know, I figured out a lot of memory issues there. Um, so, I'm, I, I try to be as memory conscious as possible. Now, one of the things, like for example, that, that is nice about you know, using an, doing an Ember app is that it's easy to set your, up your bindings, your objects, and all that stuff. It's really quick and easy. But then you may have to go back and make sure that, you know, do I need to bind this property, for example? Maybe I should use that as an unbound, because it never changes. You know, stuff like that. So you just, it's, it's, it's easy to run away, <laughs> you know? But as long as you're, you're careful, it's, it's actually pretty good. In the back. That's a good question. Um, I've actually really only used this <laughs> templating system. Um, uh, with Sprocore, uh, for example, um, they don't really use, I, I used uh, handlebars as well. And uh, uh, most of the stuff, unfortunately, in Sprocore previously was all like you, you write your own uh, HTML or you have a function that outputs HTML a string. So that's not necessarily the best thing. But templating is definitely the way to go. Yeah, uh, so I, the size of the, the actual library seems kind of high. Are you actually bundling the, the code as part of the native app when it's distributed, or are you actually downloading over the wire? Right now we're downloading over the wire, but it's G, when it's gzipped, it's pretty small. Okay. Yeah. Did, do you know if there's any plans to actually break it up into smaller pieces? So you can do that. You can actually do that. Um, Right now, uh, we're not do, I'm like I'm not doing that, but it's definitely uh, relatively easy to do. They have a lot of packages, so you can add and remove things as you as you go along. Uh, you can make it a lot smaller if, if you need to. Like the the core of Ember provides a lot of stuff that Backbone does, if not a comparable, and it's really small. But then you know if you want to have views and you want to have state charts and all that stuff, which are nice to have, then it's you know it, it does add up. But I think um, the benefits of it is higher than the negatives, because you end up writing less code yourself. So it's, it's kind of you know, a wash in some ways, right? Yeah. So I can actually show you. What I, what I do here. So um, we're actually, we're not Rails based, but uh, one of the things that we do, uh, so we actually use PHP. And here is a, you know, I want to find a simple example. So for example, here's my locations. This is really hard to read, I'm sorry. Uh, let me font bigger. Why is that not working? There it is. Can you guys see that? Can you see that? <laughs> OK. Basically, um, and of course, my scroll position completely changed. Um, this is the handlebars template. Uh, one of the things that I do is uh, we do localization, which is just PHP. Uh, PHP. So instead of doing it in JavaScript, which you can, um, I just I'll put it on the screen right here because there's no there's no reason to you know waste JavaScript cycles to do localization. So it actually is pretty simple. Um, but uh, so yeah, so we're using a combination of like PHP for the stuff. But you can use Rails or you know any backend you want. No. Um, what it actually does, and let me. This I can't make bigger. But um, so uh, it 
So for example, uh, this is a service. This property, right? Yeah, I know, I know. It's just, that's true. So here, for example, I used unbound, so just printed it out, right? But if I want to have something that's a bound property, um, I want to see a bound property that actually has something. So give me a second here. So I'm using unbound for most of these things. But one of the things here is I can, uh, it actually adds a, script, a little script tag to figure out where it is. Um, so basically, you'll only change that part of, the, of your template. It won't change the entire thing. Um, so if you change one property, it'll only touch one part of the DOM, which is nice. Um, that's just internal bookkeeping for Ember. So basically, um, since I switch everything over to Unbound, it's a little hard to <laughs> explain. But basically, it just, it just says that your code is going to go inside of this block. So um, actually, I believe that these are actually if statements right here. So, so that, that'll actually be an if statement. And then if that thing, it'll put stuff in there. That makes sense. So basically, inter internally at Ember, they'll, I mean, they, they have some, well, it's, it's a placeholder. It basically has, you know, this is a block. And if the block is true in, in their internal logic, it'll output stuff in between these tags. That's, that's it. Yeah, uh, here, I'll repeat that. <laughs> I'll repeat it. Um, uh, Keith just said that one of the things, uh, one of the reasons why using script tags is that it's always valid to have it anywhere in the DOM. So you can just put it anywhere. Any other questions? Oh, yeah? Uh, no, it doesn't use un underscore. It does use jQuery. Sorry? Yeah, I think the, also the application is slightly different, right? Um, but yeah, I, I, I like this, this method myself. Any other questions? Yeah, but if uh, they all have um, you, they all have unique IDs. Yeah, but if, if the, the place on the page is the order of the column of the script. That I don't. Uh, I, off the top of my head, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, sometimes it's it's just nicer to do that. Um, let me see if there's a good example. Um, one of the things I do in my state chart, sometimes it's just easier to, like, here I want to hide something. I just use, I, or add a class. I just do that. It's quicker if it's only done once. And you know, having a reference, uh, make that an Ember object or Ember view and all that stuff, sometimes it's just overkill. You don't need to do it. Questions? You had a question? Uh, sort of. Or comment? So, um, so I understand that you're saying it relies on jQuery. Mm -hmm. Do you think you guys, maybe in the future, will kind of bundle in sort of like a jQuery-like view like Angular does or mm. something like that? I don't know. I, I, the, or is it the yeah. So um, I don't know what the like what their roadmap is for the Ember guys. Um, I'm going to be talk to them later. But, oh, okay. um, uh, yeah, I would like to have a lighter weight, you know, framework backing backing it because I J, I think jQuery does probably too much. Right. Uh, so I, I'm sure that they're going in a direction that to make it light, you know, they always want to make it lighter weight. But the, the the other argument that they're they're having is that jQuery is pretty widely deployed, right. and if you load it from like the from Google, 
you generally will have it. So that's kind of the approach that they want to take. Uh, if you have jQuery loaded, should they should work? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can run this in the mixed environment. It doesn't really. It's not all or nothing, right? Um, the the idea is that if you want to have you know take some of the benefits of Ember, you can use that, and if you want to do some other custom code, um, you can do that too. I, I write you know for, for this app, not only do I use templates, but I also do custom code. So for example, like um, for this little date picker. Like I, I don't want to write a template for this. So I just write out the HTML and then I drive it via JavaScript. So like this is all, this isn't a template. This is just you know, pure JavaScript, so it works. All right. No more questions? All right. All right, thank you.